get together the the feasts and the merry making that was all not there so i think that is the same for all of you also so this, this is what 2020 has been a bit of a curse for all of us for students for all everybody all around i don't know when it is going to end now even newspapers were not available in the last five days so we are not able to tell exactly what the situation is about the covid virus once once the newspapers start publishing the local news then we will have a better idea of whether the pandemic has become worse or is it still at its same level so if it happens to become worse then the chances of our college opening is further delayed and if it has not been too bad i hope they take decisions about opening the college in the near future and how they will go about it is still a still a guess for everybody i suppose they will call students in batches as many as they can admit and as many as will be allowed considering that social distancing has to be maintained so based on that possibly they will these are the two factors one is how badly the pandemic has spread after the puja and west bengal is likely to have a further spread of the pandemic because um there have been crowds on the roads there have been crowds at some pandals in some places the metro rail has opened public transport was quite filled up and i my personally i was noticing that there were a lot of people on the roads you cannot stop them so even if they have taken all the precautions the spread of the pandemic spread of the disease cannot be controlled if there are too many people in a single place anyway i think 28 boys are here now we can talk on our subject matter first of all before i talk my warmest greetings to all of you this bijaya and the shera i hope you are all in good health more than having enjoyed yourself your health is of priority the placements are taking place for the senior batches 2017 entry and 2016 entry but albeit on a slower scale because everything is now online interviews are online assessment of the uh, cvs assessment of the papers everything is online and thereafter the boys themselves have to get their medical reports and then submit it to the company so it's a much slower process and over and above that the boys will be quarantined once they go to the office of mining shipping company office and there will be a some period of quarantine there there will be medical tests there will be the covid test so all these things are taking too much time so the whole process of getting boys on board the ship has become very cumbersome and getting you off the ship will also be equally cumbersome so once you are on the ship be prepared to stay there for at least 9 months to 1 year you will not be able to come back before 9 months to 1 year that is the guidance i am able to give right now because shipping companies are also not very keen to take off from the ship if the ship is safe and in fact you are safer on the ship if it does not have any infection on board so a lot of boys are raring to go on board the ship but remember once you go on the ship you can't be raring to get off the ship you have to remain on the ship for a good period of time and i would say anything between 9 months and 12 months i know the minimum requirement is 6 months but it could become 9 months to 12 months and another factor is there in the 6 month duration that you will be doing your shipboard training 
two thirds of it is required as propelling time. You understand what is propelling time? Propelling time means just sitting on the ship and the ship is not moving anywhere is not going to be accounted on your record. The ship has to be moving. So how much of movement should be there? It should be that out of six months, four months, the propeller must be turning. So from the time the propeller starts to move to the time the propeller stops moving, there are records on the ship. And those records have to be accumulated. After accumulation, the time period for which the propeller has been turning has to be measured or calculated. And that time period should be equal to two thirds of the time that you have been on the ship. The time that you're on the ship is called article time. And the time that the propeller has been moving and you're on the ship is called propeller time. So this propeller time has to be equal to two thirds of your article time. If you don't have that two thirds of your article time, you may have spent six months on the ship, but you will not be permitted for sitting in the exams. Because in the certificate that you get from the ship, when you get off from the ship, is the total article time and propelling time. These two value or these two records are also inserted. And this is as per the ship's logs. So on, based on this, you will be allowed to sit for your exam. So a lot of boys don't take the chance of coming back exactly after six months because they may fall short of the propeller time by one day or two days. And then again, you have to go back to the ship to spend some months to recover that one month, one day or two days of propelling time. So it is best to spend a little more time on the ship, say nine months, and be better acquainted with the ship's machinery, learn a little more. So that when you come from the ship, you are better prepared for the exam that you have to sit at the MMD. All right, we have 33 boys here now. Uh, let me have a few words regarding your class tests that you have performed. Most of them have performed well. There was one exceptional, very good paper. And that was, I think, two or three candidates have given three, maybe four maximum. And I think two are from your class. One is Sakya Chatterjee. His paper was a very good paper. I don't remember the other name, but there were two or three more boys who have prepared, done very well. So I appreciated that. And I was purposely looking into whether you have used your own language, whether you have put down your own thoughts, rather than simply copying from the PowerPoint presentation or from the books. So because this is more like an open book class test, you could refer to any book while you're writing what you're writing. So it would be more creditable if you were actually writing down your thoughts, your own ideas, your own language. There were errors in the language, but that also told me that it was your own original thought process. So I appreciate that. And I've given credit for that. But those which have been strictly copy and paste from the PowerPoint program, you have got marks. Everybody has passed. But you will not get as much credit as those who have used their own concepts. So what we are going to discuss, oh, I have to put it on record first, no? Have I put it on record? Oh, yes, already on record. I am presenting. You can see my screen. So what we are going to go through, I know you have done two questions out of the three questions that were given to you. But I have given altogether 18 different questions, all put in different ways for the six sections. Each section has got three questions. And I would like you to tackle all the 18 questions. You have already tackled two questions. I would like you to tackle all the remaining 16 questions to be much more familiar with the subject matter up to and where I have taught you. All right, let's go through the questions and I'll definitely share with you this lecture so that you can actually get the questions that are there. The first one was section A. 
Section A had three questions. Draw and explain the heat balance diagram of a diesel engine with specific details to justify assumptions, which means you need to put in the parameters of the fuel oil that is being used to calculate the heat balance diagram or to make out the heat balance diagram and also the engine specifications which was using that specific grade of fuel. What was the output of the engine? So based on these two relevant parameters, you can make a very authentic heat balance diagram. You cannot simply make a heat balance diagram giving general data. So that heat balance diagram has to be justified with the assumptions that you make, which means the parameters of the fuel oil, that means the uh, heat value of the fuel oil, and also the engine that is using that particular oil to give the required performance. So this has to be put in there. A lot of boys have done it satisfactorily and they've got their credit. Next one was sketch and describe a bed plate of a large diesel engine. What reason justify the use of different materials in the components? Uh, sketch and describe the bed plate was a little untidy. I would have expected a little better diagrams with better labeling and the different material compositions is one is made of mild steel and the transverse girders are made of cast steel. Why so? Because they are subject to a lot of bending stresses during the firing of the engine. That has to be elaborated a little more and the answer has to be put in. I would suggest you actually have a register with these questions and with the answers made out point-wise. Do not make extensive writings, make only point-wise and make the points very, very relevant to the question asked. Do not write points which have no relevance to the question asked. That is very important. Tendency to go out of topic is very common, especially when you think you know a lot about that answer. The point uh, and what happens is you go out of topic and then it becomes a difficult situation for the examiner to give you marks. So stick to what has been asked and answer only the question. The examiner wants to know whether you know the answer to that question. He doesn't want to know what you know beyond that question. So be careful about how you answer the questions. Same thing goes for any interviews. When you're asked a question, answer what has been asked. Do not give information related to the question or related to the answer. That is not clear. That is beating around the bush. And immediately the examiner will know that you don't know, you're simply filling up words and sentences. So be very careful in how. Be very specific, be very direct, be very perfect in your answer. At least try for that perfection. Okay, next is define flash point, ignition point, fire point, and explain the importance of each. This is something a lot of boys did not attempt. I was surprised, yet it is one of the easiest ones. At the same time, a little error will cause the whole answer to go wrong. Anyway, the boys were wise enough not to attempt this because I have not given specific answers to this question during any of the PowerPoint program. It was for your own thinking. It is something that you have to find out on your own. All right. So this was for section A that I asked. Let us see section F. This, your section is section E today. Yes. Section E. Section F had questions which are a little more detailed and a little tighter. List all the principal components of a two-stroke class board diesel engine and briefly state their individual functions. So the answer could have been for two hours also, this particular question. If a person who is very knowledgeable on the engine components can write this answer for a period of two hours. You have been given just half an hour, which is a long time for an answer. And a reasonable answer should encompass what has been taught to you and possibly a little more what you've read on the subject beyond what is given to you in class. That is very important. <clears throat> Next, what we have is explain why breathing characteristics of an engine plays a significant role in the performance of an engine. Okay, 
Now, here, this is something I explained at the very beginning of your classes. And the breathing characteristics largely depends on air handling. That means how well the air is reaching into the combustion chamber before fuel is injected and combustion takes place. And the importance of this air reaching inside. Ultimately, a lot of matters, a lot of factors are responsible for ensuring that the air reaches the cylinder. One is the air filter, which protects the engine from any dust or dirt particles entering into the cylinder. You see, air filter is a very important part. Why? Because the dust that is there in the air will ultimately go inside the cylinder and combustion chamber and become like an abrasive. And fine dust between the rings and the liner will cause enormous wear down, very rapid wear down. So it is almost like using emery paper inside the cylinder. You know what is emery paper? It is the same thing as sandpaper. So it works like sandpaper if dust is allowed to go in. So you have an air filter. This air filter is generally made of either felt or it is made of a copper wire mesh, very fine copper wire mesh, which is coated with lubricating oil. This dust which tries to go beyond the mesh gets stuck on the surface of that copper mesh, which is actually a layer on the suction filter of the turbocharger. And this copper mesh is coated with lubricating oil. Lubricating oil is a little sticky also. So any dust that goes through that filter first gets stuck on the surface of that copper mesh. So no dust can go in. So in case this filter gets choked, then the quantum of air reaching the cylinder will have reduced. But the fuel injected is not being reduced. So the fuel being injected will be more in proportion to the air requirement. And thereby the combustion will suffer. And if it suffers, it means a lot of carbon will be discharged. Incomplete combustion will take place. After burning will take place. Soot deposits will take place right through your exhaust pipe, inside your exhaust gas boiler. All the problems will start with in, in, ineffective breathing of the engine. <coughs> Effective breathing means satisfactory quantity of air reaching the combustion chamber. Now somebody's come now. Where is it now? Saurabh Kumar, 8169. And Shubankar, oh, Somya Mukherjee has also come now. And Shubankar, I want you to take a record of the candidates yes, who are present and at, at the end of the class, let me know. Yes, sir. we'll do that, sir. Okay, thank you. So, breathing characteristics is the fundamental importance of the engine. Try to practice these questions in writing point-wise. Do not write essay type of answers because the amount of writing becomes very huge. Write relevant points related to the questions. Third question that I have asked section F is, what is the purpose of the cylinder head in the engine, in the diesel engine? That is one. Purpose, you should know what it is. It is just the last part of the combustion chamber. It encloses the combustion chamber and provides for a means of injecting fuel, releasing excess pressure, measuring the conditions inside the cylinder, things like that. So these are affected by means of mountings. So what are the mountings in a two-stroke and a four-stroke engine? Briefly explain their function. Most of the boys did well with two-stroke and four-stroke with the four standard mountings that are there. But they forgot about the rocker arm assembly and the valves, the inlet outlet valve. They are also considered as mounting because they are mounted on the cylinder cover. That's all. So practice these questions because ultimately at some stage again you will be facing these questions. What is a crosshead in an engine and why is it necessary? I don't expect you to give a very detailed answer, but the basic concept of a crosshead should be apparent to you. And why is it necessary? This necessity arises because of the long stroke of the engine. And why do trunk engines not have a crosshead? Because the trunk type of engines do not have a very long stroke. 
okay it is the crossing is necessary because the stroke is long okay in another section i have asked the question why are long stroke engines necessary so that is necessary because the quality of the oil that is being burnt in today's engines is poorer and poor quality with the concept of economy in mind so why do trunk engines not have i think the question is quite simple for section e that was your section what are the cylinder liners in the diesel engine made of catch a two stroke and a four stroke cylinder liner? i was quite pleased with this answer from most of you because you have not only followed the powerpoint you have also followed my earlier notes given to you some of you boys have got my earlier notes i think in xerox copies from that guy in cpc colony he is selling those notes to boys and there in those notes i have had the same diagram but i in this particular one i forgot to put the spigot or the groove in the liner for the spigot and some boys have mentioned put that i was very appreciative of that move and i can understand that you are studying more than what is simply told in the class that's a very good sign and a positive active action in that direction list all the parts of a trunk this was the easiest question but very few attempted it but anyway it is quite a simple question you have to state the function of all the parts i was expecting you to give me the function of the cylinder head in particular and this is the questions which are asked of section c what do you understand by compression ignition engines and explain the restrictions or limitations on these engines mainly the restrictions is the compression ratio and this compression ratio is largely dependent on the bore or the size of the diameter of the cylinder liner and the strength of the material these are the two parameters we define the limitations of compression ratio some late bird has come in who is this shobit okay now it is already 950 almost 1 hour Oh, sorry almost 20 minutes okay no more no more admissions so we have a final score of 35 and the score should have been 38 plus 2 40 so there are five absentees okay so section c has what do you understand by compression ignition engine so write about five points as basics for a compression ignition engine and then explain the restrictions or limitation about 3 to 4 points are the reasons for the limitations of these three engines that finishes the answer in a proper exam if you have the time you can elaborate on these points next question asked was what is the purpose of having longer stroke marine diesel engine is something like the previous section question was there <clears throat> what is the purpose of crossed engine now i had to put another question related to the same subject matter so i have put in what is the purpose of having longer stroke marine diesel engine longer stroke marine engine is for mainly fuel economy you burn poorer and poorer grades of fuel which are cheaper and cheaper to get the power output from the engine therefore you need to have uh, longer stroke marine diesel engine what changes this is a little out of the way question that i put to them and i don't think maybe one or two boys has got the catch not everybody one or two boys they have been able to answer this question what changes are necessary to enable such longer stroke to be accommodated <coughs> the main changes if you see you have a longer stroke engine the piston rod has to be very long all right so that the crosshead is positioned much lower and where the connecting rod fitted to it the angularity will not interfere with the uh, liner at the bottom now moment you have a connecting rod and a long piston rod the engine height becomes very high so the way to reduce the height of the engine is to reduce the length of the connecting rod and make it just about enough so that it is the crosshead will remain above the diameter of the crank rotation and the angularity will be maximum when the piston is at mid stroke of the cylinder liner when it is a mid stroke obviously around the curvature of the diameter it will be somewhere in the middle 
and that makes for the largest angle of the connecting rod against the vertical okay now moment you have a very large angularity then the transverse force becomes very large on the a frame and the casing so singular a frames with casing plates is not enough to accommodate those transverse forces what you need is box like a frame structures in other words mono block a frame structures are required when the strokes are very long because the transverse force on the guide and guide shoe becomes much more and because of this you require mono block structures this is the main changes that is required to enable such longer strokes to be accommodated <clears throat> apart from this if you have longer stroke engines you will need not to have the skirt because the guides will provide for the alignment of the piston because the piston is got a rod piston rod and it is also got a crosset so the crosset provides the alignment of the piston because the piston is not fixed anywhere it is sliding inside the liner so it can move sideways so to uh, to maintain alignment of the piston the crosset is in a fixed guide which will allow the crosset to move absolutely vertically and maintain that alignment you don't need a skirt where will you need a skirt for a piston you will need a skirt in a piston when there is an exhaust port and an inlet port because you cannot allow the inlet port and exhaust port to open to each other when the piston is at tdc then what will happen a lot of air will either go through the exhaust or the exhaust pressure at that particular time is more than the inlet pressure exhaust will go in so instead of having valves you have the skirt of the piston functioning like a valve you get it only when the piston goes to bdc that time the ports are open respectively first the exhaust port then the inlet port then again inlet port gets closed exhaust port gets closed and both of them remain closed because the rest of the skirt keeps it closed <clears throat> next is why do foundation bolts and tie rods fail mostly due to fatigue failure apart from fatigue failure if it was actual only fatigue failure then all the tie rods would have failed at the same time because they are subject to the same number of cycles over a period of years but the tie rods which have an inherent fault inherent fault means suppose at the thread section one particular tie rod has a little bit of a more depth in the threads possibly that tie rod is a little weaker than the others so that will fail first if one tie rod has a molecular fault in its structure of the material where two molecules are not uh, bonded correctly inside then that one molecule failure will start giving rise to the other failures it is like a chain reaction and then a inherent fault will if there is a if there is a dent on the tie rod then again that dent could be the origin of a fatigue failure you see in a chain a chain has got multiple links similarly an engine has got multiple tie rods okay now if the chain is pulled and you keep pulling keep pulling keep pulling at one stage one link will fail now how you decide which link is going to fail it is the weakest link that is going to fail so uh, what makes it very weak possibly some material fault inside that chain link possibly some scratch possibly some dent so that particular link will fail first it is not that all the links will fail similarly at the same time similarly for the tie rods the tie rod which is the weakest which you cannot see which i cannot see which in the tests also cannot be seen but definitely all tie rods are not down to the last Millimeter, micrometer perfect in their strengths one will be a little stronger and weaker than the other depending on what is the material construction what is the machining of the surface whether any different things 
So ultimately, a thyroid will fail on fatigue failure, but the one that has got the inherent fault will originate that fatigue failure. Similarly, for foundation bolts, foundation bolts also fail on account of fatigue failure because over a period of time, the ship has been rolling port and starboard, port and starboard. So the foundation bolts are stretched, release, stretch, release, stretch, release. So these are also subject to fatigue failures because once the engine rolls over to the starboard side, then the port side bolts are pulled up. Then when it rolls back onto the port side, then the starboard sides are pulled up. So this happens over the entire life of the ship as it is sailing over the seas. So that is why foundation bolts fail. Otherwise, normally you would think, why should a foundation bolt fail? It is simply keeping two places tight. It is keeping two places tight, but it is also subject to fluctuating stresses. That is why. Most bolts are under static load. That's why they don't fail for years. But foundation bolts are under a fluctuating load, which will cause them a possible failure. Okay. Next, what we have is section D. Section D has three questions, much like yourself. And here is where I've asked for the two-stroke cycle. And describe the two-stroke cycle with the help of a timing diagram. I am pretty sure everybody had studied the two-stroke cycle and the four-stroke cycle thoroughly. And most of them did get it right. Mm, and uh, yes, even there, some boys have used my previous year's notes where I have drawn the two-stroke cycle along with the cylinder liner to show the position of the BDC, to show the position at which the inlet valve opens, where the exhaust port opens, sorry, inlet port opens, exhaust port opens, and the TDC. So a cylinder liner corresponding to the timing diagram is an excellent explanation. One or two boys have done it, and I have appreciated that effort because it is beyond what I have actually given you in your PowerPoint program. Anyway, have, the boys have done well in most of the questions. Even, even if you have taken help from books, I appreciate it. The test by itself is not only a test, it is also a learning process. So that is why I appreciate if you have taken help and got a reason. Almost everybody's got similar marks, maybe one mark plus or minus here and there. So that is why it has been a good learning process for you also. And I appreciate the effort that you have taken. Explain compression ratio of a diesel engine. There were some mistakes here again, in spite of my repeatedly telling you that it is not from ratio from BDC to TDC. That is not what is compression ratio. It is the volume of air at the start of compression to the volume of air at the end of the compression. So it is V uh, volume at the start of compression is say how much V C plus the clearance volume. And again, it is the final ratio to the clearance volume. So that is what the concept has to be clear to write down any mathematical ratios. Mathematical ratios, you mug up. That is why you make a mistake. Do not mug up mathematical ratios. Understand the concept. It is the volume before compression, which means the piston has already traveled beyond BDC and it's on its way up. And the inlet port is closed and the air is trapped before it starts compressing. So that volume to the clearance volume, that means when the piston is at TDC. So these are the two volumes which make up for the compression ratio. It is not from BDC to TDC because there is no compression from the BDC up to the point where it closes the inlet port. That has to be very clear in your mind. I was a little upset with two or three boys who made this mistake. That means they have not understood and I have not been able to make them understand. And I think I will have to do something about it. So anyway, let's go to the next one. What is bore cooling in diesel engines? Bore cooling in diesel engines was given to you like a definition over there. And most of the boys have been able to explain it in their own words. So I've given them the requisite credit. 
which component of this engine use this process lot of boys have given only three they have not given the other two but the other two are also included because they also have narrow passages in the nozzles and in the valves to provide for cooling i appreciate some of you have given the sketch of a four stroke cylinder head with the bore cooling that was your own initiative and i have given credit for that so that was a very good answer that you have given let's move on to our next question paper is there any or this is the last one yeah section b was the last section that had its questions and the three question put to them was explain the purpose and importance of tie rods in a long stroke engine so there you are the tie rods have to be explained here and what reasons could explain their failure i just now explained to you why tie rods fail so have these ans questions written down in a register and have these point wise answers made out and just write the relevant points do not make impressive answers because nobody is going to read it it is for your reference only that you are going to make out the answers and these questions will again be repeated if i am required to make out the question paper for fifth semester semester exam i'll definitely be referring to some of these questions or it will be a combination of these questions to make a fresh question i will never repeat a question in toto from a previous paper i will make a fresh question altogether with the objective of getting to know whether you have understood the subject matter it is not getting to know whether you have done mugging up no it is getting to know whether you have understood the subject that is most important so when you go to explain something and you have mugged up something you will forget some part and you will not be able to remember i have actually in my student days tried to mug up and i have found i have made a mess of a lot of things by mugging up so then i got around to getting to the actual point of understanding it and explaining in my own words i found i used to get much more credit for that though my explanation was not as good as what i has to read or what i has to uh, access from books papers etc that time we did not have internet or anything we only had books and lectures so we could follow that so try to understand it and explain in your own words i am sure you will get more credit than simply mugging up in toto from the pages of books or from the internet okay <clears throat> with the help of a timing diagram explain the four stroke cycle of a diesel engine this one it was very funny that a lot of boy did not attempt it i had expected everybody to attempt it because it is a something that you can display very well a four stroke timing diagram is a little more detailed than your two stroke timing diagram and i had already explained to you what is valve overlap of the valve and give reasons for such i wasn't very happy with the answers maybe two or three boys could get the answer correctly and others did not attempt it the reason for valve overlap is one to ensure whatever residual gases exist in the clearance volume is also cleared out so you have a fresh charge of air in the cylinder before the next induction and compression takes place that is one reason second reason was to provide some cooling to the piston crown to the combustion belt of the liner and to the exhaust valve which takes the brunt of the heat that develops during combustion so once you cool these components your engine efficiency also improves to a significant amount so the reason for valve overlap is remove whatever residual gases to fill up with fresh air and number 2 to cool the components of the combustion chamber to give a better performance and efficiency of the engine all right so that is what valve overlap is about okay next one is describe the differences of a crosshead engine and a trunk type of engine it was quite simple and one of the simplest would have been to draw the two sketches together one was a simple two stroke 
cross-head type of Indian, one was a trunk type of Indian. Once you draw the two sketches and you label them, then you could have written down the description in very, very brief points. Construction. This has this, that has this. This one has this, that one has that. That's the construction. Function. The crosshead does this, and then and the piston skirt does the function of the crosshead in the two-stroke engine. So the functions are clear. The connecting rod does the same function. Crankshaft is the same function. You write over there. Function is the same as two-stroke engine. The only difference is the crosshead part of the engine. All right. So that is the 18 questions that have been formulated. And each of them is slightly different from each other. And the six sections have got all different questions. And that was my intention. And uh, I'm pretty sure you have consulted each section wise. What are the questions coming around? Now here I am presenting you the questions for you to practice the remaining 16 questions which you did not have to answer. But in your own interest, try and answer these 16 questions for your own learning process. All right, let's move on to our subject where we had left off and, and continue. Uh, we were, oh, we had last, our last diagram that I had shown you was the splinter. Yes, what is it? Yes. What is it? Sir, what is oh. performance difference between trunk? Sir, what is uh, difference between uh, difference in performance of trunk type engine and the sir, cross head type engine? Okay, the performance difference is it has got four strokes to uh, go through in the four stroke engine and in the two stroke, it is two stroke. If you are considering in the trunk type of engine for four stroke engine, it is half the power that is or not exactly half, it is almost two thirds <clears throat> of the power developed in a two stroke engine. That is the main difference between the two. Performance wise, a trunk type engine will have to, uh, uh, the output for a similar type of two stroke engine, the two stroke engine will be providing you more power than a four stroke engine. That is the main power difference. Okay. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, Shubha Vijaya, sir, sir okay. I have a question. Uh, uh, yes. So, in, in one of the sections, you asked a question about if a tie rod breaks in the middle, then how will we uh, uninstall it? <laughs> so, I have been doing a little bit of thinking. I couldn't uh, find the answer. So, if you can discuss it. There is no answer anywhere. You have to improvise your own methods in removing that tie rod. So, you then good. So then do we have, if we can pull out uh, the upper end of the tie rod and then no put problem. it is, and uh, then uh, if we can uh, install a lesser uh, diameter than the uh, tie rod and then put an adhesive that is used in cars to join the supercar parts and then if we, uh, uh, you know, put it inside uh, the thread and then uh, try to stick it with the uh, lower end of the broken tie rod and then if we can rotate it and pull it out, can we do that in that way? It Any is... process is satisfactory, but it has to be practical. It has to be authentic and it has to be possible. The examiner will know whether that process, possibility is there in your answer or not. Now you're saying adhesive. What adhesive are you going to use? Araldite? Araldite is not going to help. There is so no the one I've heard, so the one I've heard that uh, they use some kind of a very strong glue to stick the uh, the car parts, super car parts. So I thought that if no, nothing else was coming in my mind, so if you can do that, you, you can stick the lower end and then pull it out by rotating it. It's that way. See what you, they, there is no gap between the tie rod and the passage through which the tie rod passes through. So you cannot really pass any wire or iron or wire sling through that. The only other way that I have thought about is use a hydraulic jack at the bottom and in step by step keep raising the tie rod right to the upward portion and then lift it out from top. All right. So, but if we use, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. So you lift up that from the top. Then when you remove the hydraulic jack from the bottom, you can remove the pieces which will come down from the bottom. And they are individual pieces which have to be fitted in, hydraulically lifted up, then use another jack to remove the same jack, put another piece and another jack from the bottom. 
so it is a matter of time and hydraulically lifting up that broken half of the tie rod from the top you cannot remove it from the bottom because the sump is what encloses the engine and below the sump you have the double bottom of the <coughs> ship and you obviously cannot make a hole through the ship to take it out into the water so, so it has to we... be lifted up from top Yes, sir. So, but if we use hydraulic power, then uh, water will get inside the engine, and then might the oil can also come out of the engine. Why can't we use the pneumatic uh, process? Pneumatic any pressure? any pneumatic press or hydraulic press, but it has to be pushed from underneath till it comes out from the top. Once it protrudes from the top, then you can grip it with the clamp and lift it yes, out sir. with a crane, because the yes, weight sir. of that broken tie rod will be. in about 1 ton or even excess of 1 ton so yes. it is not a light item so the only way is to use improvise method for repair and marine engineer should be expert in improvising methods of repairs and indian engineers have the reputation of being some of the most resourceful marine engineers because they can improvise repairs on items which are normally discarded you will see that in our local markets also they will repair anything they will repair your cell phone they will repair your laptop they will repair anything abroad they don't bother to repair because the cost of repair is more than the cost of getting a new item but for us as indian that situation does not arise we will proceed into repairs even the repair may not be as good as the original but we are capable of that and that capability arises on account of our resourcefulness we will somehow make it work that is what this question is intended for your ability to improvise your resourcefulness that is there being prepared in you as a marine engineer that is why such a question of course it has never happened that a tie rod has broken from the metal abhi either break from the ends because that is where the threaded section is the the question that it has been broken from the middle is purely a hypothetical concept it will never ever break from the middle because it is much stronger at the middle than what it is at the ends the ends where the threads are and in fact at the bottom of the thread <coughs> or at the neck is where it breaks because it is the weakest same thing in a bolt if you see a nut and bolt and you keep tightening which is the portion that it will break it will break at the end of the thread that means yes, the the threads which continues up to the point where the thread ends that is the weakest part of the bolt and if the rest of the bolt is uniform in all other aspects that is the portion where it will fail so if you keep tightening a bolt keep tightening a bolt and the bolt gives way it will be at the end of the thread that it will give way nowhere else similarly when you tighten the tie bolts at the ends of the thread it will break either at the top or at the bottom but more likely it is going to be at the top end why because it has the weight of the tie rod also to be accommodated at the top rather than at the bottom yes sir okay so that is the question put to you because your ability to improvise is being checked out how will you do it similarly i will give you more questions which will require your resourcefulness in tackling such problem there were problems which i also had on board the ship you see like a turbocharger we had and if the turbocharger fails you are required to remove the bearings and that is a standard procedure what the book tells you is not always what happens so we had a turbocharger where the turbo charge of turbine and overheated and the it started smoking so we had to stop and we found that the bearings are partially damaged we cannot run the turbo charger and the procedure for locking the turbo charger is to remove the bearings and put plates across to bolt it so that the rotor does not turn now out at sea we had a situation like this where we could not simply remove the bearings the bearings were fused in the metal of the shaft so there was no scope of locking the turbocharger by first removing the bearings but you have to do something you cannot remain out at sea and ask for help from shore so what what we did 
we simply bolted the rotor against the casing through clamps which were removed from outside pipes which had clamps on them so those clamps from the pipelines were removed and they were put on the shaft and bolted to the base so the whole rotor shaft was locked in place in spite of the bearings being there so when we finally started the engine we found the rotor was holding and it was not rotating and that was our intention so ultimately when we reached port they were very surprised that we could run the engine by locking the turbocharger rotor without removing the bearings so it became a new method that if the bearings are not removed you can still lock the turbocharger and that is not there in any manual not there in any book no manufacturer will ever recommend it or suggest it because they don't think beyond that the bearing can get seized inside and it may not be extractable so you will have to improvise these methods as and how you face it it is not that everything is go you have to go by the book and uh, not every problem has its solution in the book and more often than not i will tell all of you in the class that there is a chapter of troubleshooting in every manual all right and more often than not the troubles that you will face will not be listed in the troubleshooting chapter the troubles you will have are not even recorded so you will have to find solutions on your own there is no book no guide no help out at sea so what you think best is what you will do and if your fundamentals are strong you will definitely find a solution because you can't remain floating out at sea for the rest of your life you have to get to shore all right so our our performance as marine engineers is quite unlike the shore based engineers who have immediate help should the situation arise but for marine engineers there is no help you have to find your own solutions out at sea at the most you may get a call from the shore do this and do that but ultimately what you do is what you think you may get some verbal help or lip service from shore but that may not be something because they don't they are not faced with the immediate problem they are not right there you can send pictures and all that but still that is a more modern concept ask our times we didn't have all this there was no communication with the shore from out at sea so we had what we had and we had to face this in that way okay let's proceed with our subject now i think that's enough about tie rods and resourcefulness so what we had last was uh this was the yeah next was a little a brief about yeah this was section b and after that was this particular plate i had asked the question what is the purpose of the crosshead now here is the description of the crosshead this is a forged steel back block secured to the foot of the piston rod it includes the journal of the top end bearing which acts as a hinge by which the piston thrust is deflected via the connecting rod to the rotate the crank this is the description of the crosshead everybody knows the purpose of the crosshead now you not need to know the description of the crosshead so it's basically i have some diagrams which will help you i have given you first i have given a total of three diagrams the first diagram is from the book which is reasonably explainable explanatory the second one is also reasonably explanatory third one is which i have drawn and i think it is most explanatory because that is what i found very easy to understand but first let's read up on what the crosshead is about it includes the journal of the top end bearing that is the crosshead bearing which acts as a hinge by which the piston thrust is deflected via the connecting rod to rotate the crank this is quite understandable the transverse force component is transmitted to the guide shoe and guide which also form part of the assembly now when i tell you crosshead assembly it means the crosshead the shoe and the guide all this is the crosshead assembly or rather it will be only the shoe the guide and the guide shoe have to go together so you can include that as part of the assembly the uh, the crosshead bearings are most difficult to lubricate this is a question that you will be faced on and on and on and repeatedly 
why is it difficult to lubricate because at all times there is a pressure from the piston its mass the piston rod its mass they all have a certain force on the crosshead bearing and this force never reduces it never goes off and it is more during the expansion stroke and during partly during the compression stroke so at all times the bearing is loaded and there is never a gap between the journal and the bearing surface so it is very difficult to get the oil between the two surfaces because the swivel action requires some amount of lubrication between the bearing and the journal it is very difficult in the two stroke engine but the same function in the four stroke is not difficult at all it is very convenient why in the four stroke engine or in the trunk type of engine you have a condition uh, not for the two stroke only in the four stroke engine you have a condition where there are four strokes remember in the induction stroke it is the connecting rod which is pulling down the piston all right so when it pulls down the piston the bush which is supporting the gudgeon pin is clear of the gudgeon pin and that is the moment the oil which is coming through the connecting rod comes into the space between the gudgeon pin and the bronze bush so that layer of oil provides for the lubrication for the remaining three strokes also so during the next stroke which is the compression stroke there is enough oil between the surface during the combustion and expansion stroke that oil still persists between the gudgeon pin and the bronze bush and during again the next compression stroke uh, sorry the next exhaust stroke you have the oil the remaining part of the oil still lubricating following the exhaust stroke is the induction stroke again so when the connecting rod starts pulling down the piston it makes it very clear under the gudgeon pin and on in the bush so this helps the oil to again fill up that space and that oil is again adequate for the next three strokes all right so if your answer is why is it difficult to lubricate a two stroke crosshead bearing whereas it is not difficult to lubricate a connect uh, gudgeon pin bearing where the functions are more or less the same say because it is a four stroke engine it has an induction stroke which helps to give a clearance between the gudgeon pin and the bush and enable the oil to pass in whereas in the two stroke there never is such a situation at all time the bearing is continuously loaded have you understood or do you have questions sarthaki yes sir you have understood okay i hope everybody yes, sir. okay so uh, 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 yes yes go ahead sir the part where between uh, gudgeon pin and the bronze bush yes yes sir i'm not able to imagine where it is actually is and so uh, i'm having a hard time understanding uh, what is the process is about okay okay let's see uh, okay keep holding i'm going to look for a diagram i don't have it in this powerpoint uh, four stroke let me see if i have it in another diagram piston four stroke piston yeah now here you are this is a four stroke piston which i have drawn for your convenience all right this is my sketch and you should be able to understand can you understand this diagram this is the main piston what you see and this is the connecting rod and this is the gudgeon pin and what you see between the gudgeon pin and the connecting rod is a bush and that bush is a cylinder and it is made of bronze can you see it who who was asking me this question anand no sir uh, aishu bardwaj ah yes yeah, shubhankar hello yes sir yes sir yes yeah, shubhankar sir shubh shubh oh you are shubh ah uh, okay okay so sure. all right shubh now can you understand this diagram this is the main piston and this piston assembly consists of a gudgeon pin and this gudgeon pin is locked in at the ends by means of a circlip or rather two circlips one on this side one on this side because the gudgeon pin may go side to side and hit the cylinder liner when it is working 
Are you able to understand this diagram? This yes, diagram, sir. if it is turned through right angles, you will see the right hand side diagram. All right. Okay. Now, when the compression stroke takes place, the compression stroke takes place from the energy of the flywheel. So the flywheel is actually pushing the connecting rod up. So this connecting rod up being pushed up means the bottom surface of the bush is making contact with the gudgeon pin. Now, if I push the connecting rod up, it will push the gudgeon pin up and the gudgeon will up, pin will push the piston up. So that is how compression takes place. Have you understood? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, imagine the compression stroke. The compression, uh, sorry, the expansion stroke. Now, the expansion stroke is the force on top of the piston. The force on top of the piston will give the force on the two sides of the piston to act against the gudgeon pin. We will be pushing the gudgeon pin downward. And the gudgeon pin is pushed downward. It will be pushed on the downward surface of the bush over here. So, there is again no clearance over here. And the oil cannot come through and come between the gudgeon pin and the bush. So there is no scope of the oil coming into the space. It is like a blocked passage for the oil which is supposed to come in. All right. Now let us say the induction stroke. The induction stroke is again coming from the flywheel. The flywheel will pull the connecting rod down. When the connecting rod is pulled down, then the top surface of the bush will be making contact on the gudgeon pin. All right. And the bottom surface will become clear of the gudgeon pin. Because if you pull it from top, the lower part of the bronze bush will become clear of the bronze bush. So that is the point that the oil is able to go under the gudgeon pin and on top of the gudge inside the bush. So the oil has to come over here. This is where the surface is. Because ultimately the connecting rod is swiveling and all the oil has to be at the lower half. The upper half will always have a clearance during the process of expansion, during the process of compression, during the process of exhausting. Only during the exhaust, during the induction stroke, the connecting rod will be pulling down the gudgeon pin to help pull down the piston and allow the air to come into the combustion chamber. So this pulling down by the by the connecting rod will cause a clearance at the bottom and it will make contact on the top. All right. Now see my arm. I hope you can see my arm. So when the gudgeon pin is being pulled downwards, it is going to make contact on the top of the gudgeon pin and there will be a clearance on top. And when it is pushing up, then the lower part is making contact and the oil passage is blocked. So oil cannot fill up that space. Are you able to understand that during the induction stroke only that the oil can enter the space between the gudgeon pin and the bush? In the other three strokes, whatever oil remains on the surface helps to lubricate the two surfaces. So, are you clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. So, that is why cross-head bearings are difficult to lubricate. And I have not written over here that gudgeon pins are easy to lubricate, much easier. A crosshead becomes necessary when the stroke is long and the angularity of the con rod falls with the liner at the lower end. This occurs at the mid stroke of the piston. That I think I have been repeating umpteen number of times and it should be now well entrenched in your minds. Okay, so now let's have a look at the diagram of a crosshead. Now, this is a crosshead bearing actually. The guide and guide shoe are not shown here. The lower part is the connecting rod. It is like a tabletop. On the tabletop, you have two bearings, one this side and one this side. All right. They are actually in two halves, but both the halves are assembled and the whole, con whole concept has been sectioned. That means this is the lower half of the bearing on this side and this is the lower half of the bearing on this side. And that is the upper half of the bearing on the left hand side. And that is the upper half on the other side. Because it is sectioned, you cannot see the bolts which are holding them together. But this bearing is bolted to the tabletop, which is part of the connecting rod over here. It is showing only one bolt, but in reality, it may have two or more bolts to hold the two bearings on the two sides of the crossed bearing pins. The round part of the pins is here and here. That pin 
has got a hole which is drilled right through and the piston rod which has got a reduced diameter at the lower section is passed through and the lowermost part is the threaded portion where a nut is fitted and tightened so once this nut is tightened then this piston rod is rigidly coupled to this uh, crossed bearing pin all right the guide and guide shoe are not shown they are extended on this pin over here and on this pin part over here so this crossed bearing has got two supports which are both ultimately supported on the connecting rod so this provides the connecting rod ability to swivel in the forward uh, or in what you say in in the direction perpendicular to the uh, laptop screen or the screen that you have in your cell phone it can move towards you and it can move away from you that is the connecting rod movement if you take a side view of this diagram then you can call it rotating in this mode but this is the arrangement of a crossed bearing with two bearings in place now the problem over here is <clears throat> you must understand that the load on the crossed bearing is huge for a large bore diesel engine where the cylinder bore is large even a slight increase in pressure multiplied by the huge area will result in an enormous increase in force that is why you cannot afford to have very high peak pressures in two stroke large bore diesel engine because the force calculated will be the pressure multiplied by the cross sectional area of the cylinder that is the force and this force arising through the piston rod ultimately lands on this bearing this is the surface which ultimately takes that force and beyond this this force is transmitted through the connecting rod to the bottom end bearing so that bearing also takes the force and that bearing takes not only the force it also takes the weight of the piston the cross head the connecting rod all together so the maximum force is by the bottom end bearing okay so the cross head bearing is also taking an enormous amount of force to reduce this force you can't do anything but you can reduce the pressure that is acting on unit area on this two bearing surfaces one is to increase the surface area at the bottom half because it is the bottom half that takes the entire load so if you increase the area then the pressure per unit area reduces the force is still the same so if you can increase that area you will reduce the pressure thereby reducing your chances of bearing damage reducing the stress that is induced in that bearing and how can it be done okay the next diagram shows you how it can be done but let's read through what he has written crossed design with flexible support now you see this has got a c type structure which gives it some flexibility so there will be some micro millimeter depression each time a pressure acts but this is well within the elastic limit and the bearings will not get deformed because it has some capability of absorbing that compression and remaining flexible and retaining its original position once the load is taken off so this gives some flexibility in its arrangement it is not as rigid as what it is expected to be the piston rod is rigidly fixed to the crossed pin by the nut that is quite evident here you can see the piston rod which has got a narrower uh, section at the lower bottom and a portion which has got a threaded portion this threaded portion extends beyond the pin and a nut is fitted at the bottom which tightens the piston rod against this collar here so that collar of the piston rod is what takes the stress at that end and the nut over here helps to keep it tightly gripped against the piston pin so the piston rod is rigidly fixed to the cross head pin by the nut the two bearings support the two pins on either side these are round section pins and they are on either side okay the bearing supports are bolted to the connecting rod this is the bearing support that means the lower half of the bearing and it is bolted to the table top of the connecting rod the extended portion of the pins are intended to fixing the guide shoes this is the extended portion of the pin crossed pin and they are intended to fix the guide shoe 
and the guide shoe will in turn be sliding inside your guide so this is one uh, one constructional detail of a bare flexible bearing support and here is the x1 here you have the same pin but the bottom surface is a complete surface so the area on which the whole load is acting has been increased um, uh, enormously or significantly this enormous or significant increase in area has reduced the pressure on the bearing and thereby the stress on the bearing so you have the same pin which is got a round section at this point a round section at this point but on the top of the piston it has a flattened portion on which the palm of the piston rod is bolted against and held rigidly against the pin now the, the connecting rod is again having a stop keep on both sides so it has the ability to swivel it has the ability to swivel and at the same time reciprocate and um, to keep it in the guide you have the guide and guide shoe on the sides only one is shown this side is not shown one is as adequate for your uh, uh, slipper your grosset guide and guide slipper so this is a little different from the previous one where you have a smaller area on which the bearing lands so this component is much more heavily stressed out as compared to this one so the chances of this bearing failing is much more as compared to this bearing the objective is to reduce the stress on the bearing component so let's read here crossed with improved or increased bearing support as the load on the crossed bearing is continuous and significantly large it is necessary to reduce the pressure per unit area of that bearing oh i need to drink some water <clears throat> this is done with a continuous bottom support while the top of the pin accommodates the pin rod piston rod palm okay this is done with a continuous bottom pin rod accommodate the piston rod palm so the lower half is continuously accommodating the whole bearing and this is the portion which allows for the holding of the crossed pin in place lubrication is done under boost pressure so right i told you it is almost like hydraulic pressure has to be shoved in because it is under constant load there is never a time when the two surfaces are clear to enable oil come in the oil has to be forced in under enormous pressure so that we will come to later remember the crossed pin is made of forged steel okay so this is the concept of a crossed now i have drawn a crossed here which is usually on the old ma and engines with the objective of making you understand how this crossed is assembled or fitted and how it works with the lubricating part also <clears throat> okay now this is the crossed actual crossed it is a square block with partially drilled passage inside over here to allow for the piston palm to fit in and the piston palm has got four holes through which these four studs enter so the piston rod is fitted on the top over here all right okay on the sides of it you have the pins these pins have the holes which are drilled through and through and they have a hole on the surface so the oil which is pushed into this place is under enormous pressure or boost pressure so the oil which travels through this hole also produces produces to the other hole on the other side of the pin apart from that it has a hole which is drilled through the passage of the crosshead and it comes out from a little hole over here okay so the oil which is being forced here ultimately emerges from here now on this surface of the crosshead you have the shoe this is the shoe which is fitted flush on the surface by means of six studs or bolts so you see there are three three six bolt holes here and these bolt hold hold this particular flange of the shoe in place and this flange has also got a hole which matches with the hole from the crosshead and that hole proceed to come out on this surface of the flange which is part of the guide and guide shoe so once this is assembled with that 
it becomes part of the assembly so when the oil comes in from this hole and comes out from here it comes right up to this passage now this is what slides inside the guide this is what the guide is and this guide is fitted against the frame and crankcase so when the piston moves up and down the entire block with the shoe moves up and down and the crosshead is kept in position by means of this guide you see the structure of the guide it is encompassing the plate what it makes the shoe and the surface of the shoe is of white metal white metal is a surface which is capable of taking a bearing load the transverse thrust from the tri from the crosshead is transmitted through the shoe onto the surface from the surface it is transmitted to the guide shoe or rather the guide and the guide is bolted to the a frame and the side wall of the crankcase casing so that is what how it finally takes up because it is pressing against the guide and at the same time rubbing it needs lubrication so that oil emerges from the crosshead to the guide shoe through this hole and then on the surface of the guide shoe there are gutters or grooves which allow the oil to travel to all the surface area of the of the guide shoe apart from this you must understand that on the sides there are again two holes which allow the oil to go backwards in onto the other side now if you see this particular shoe from that side this is what you will see this is the reverse side of this plate so the oil which comes through this hole travels through these gutters merges through these holes on the sides and comes out onto the other side and this is the other side of the shoe and the oil then travels along this surface and in the gutters that are made on the other side of this plate why now you see in when the engine is running in one direction let's say a head direction in the head direction the maximum force comes on this surface which is transmitted to the shoe all right now that is when the expansion stroke is taking place that the thrust transverse thrust on the guide is transmitted to the guide shoe on this face all right now after the piston has gone to bdc and the crank rotates and it starts compressing the air inside the cylinder obviously the transverse thrust will be in the opposite direction because the angularity of the connecting rod is opposite to what it was during the expansion stroke all right so the transverse force will also change direction so during the expansion stroke or in the ahead direction the force is in this side and during the compression in the ahead direction only the compression the force will be on this surface here so this surface is given a smaller surface area because the transverse thrust during compression is much less than the transverse thrust during the expansion or power stroke so that is why you have a larger area during the expansion stroke and a smaller area to take the transverse thrust during the expansion stroke are you able to understand i don't know how clear i am in my language but shubhankar singh let me know if you have understood and if you have any questions how the crosshead works sir you had discussed about white metal sir it is same as aluminium tin alloy na aluminium white metal they are a special material consisting of copper lead antimony aluminium so mixture so this material is called white metal and this is a layer of metal on the steel surface because steel does not make a good bearing surface better than steel is white metal and the two surfaces which rub against each other are both white metal surfaces but have you understood how the force is in one direction during uh, expansion stroke and the force is in the opposite direction during the compression stroke yes okay good anybody having questions any clarification required 
be sure to have the doubt cleared. All right. Chub, have you understood? Yes, sir. Okay. Don't say yes if you have not understood. Ask me 10 times, I will explain 10 times. But before that, give me a break. Let me drink some water. Okay, so I hope this concept of understanding how the thrust of the crossed guide and guide you in one direction when the expansion stroke takes place and opposite direction when the compression takes place. Get it? <clears throat> sir, uh, yes. Sir, sir. Yes, sir, yes, I'm not able, uh, sir, I'm not able to uh, understand the assembly, sir. The assembly you're not able to understand. Okay, no, sir. now this is one part. This is the main cross head. It is a block of forged steel and it has got uh, pins at the sides where the connecting rod bearings are fitted. And I have not shown the connecting rod here. So it's at the lower part. Okay, and this part is also the other side of the bearing and the two bearings together are supported by the connecting rod. So the connecting rod is able to swivel about these bearings. The square section does not swivel. It is only the connecting rod with the bearings that swivel in either direction. The crosshead remains static and the only movement the crosshead does is up and down, up and down. It is the connecting rod which swivels about the two bearings and moves in either direction and of course vertically. Okay. So this crosshead is assembled with the shoe. This is called a shoe. And this shoe has two flanges. One flange on that side, which matches with the surface of that crosshead. And it is bolted to that. The oil hole, which is drilled through the pins, goes right through. And also it comes out from the bottom portion over there. I don't know, in your third semester, you have drawn the drawing of that crosshead guide and guide shoe. There, if you see, or if you still have your drawing sheets, you will see how the lubricating oil passage comes through. That is why your third semester drawing class was a very important class. And maybe I, I'll be able to show you that uh, plate where you, were, you have done that drawing. And there, this oil hole, what you see here, allows the oil to pass through the shoe and emerge from this hole over here, what you see. And as it emerges, it comes into these grooves on the surface. Remember, this surface is pressed against this surface of the guide. And this flange over here slides into the recess of that guide. So it is like a sliding inside that guide. It cannot come out unless it is completely removed. So it slides inside and it either presses in that direction or it presses on the opposite direction. So while it is reciprocating, the guide and guide shoe are continuously changing their forces on either side. So when it is in the expansion stroke, the transverse thrust from the cross end is in this direction so that this large surface area is in contact with the large surface area of the guide. And the guide, if you see, is also got bolt holes. And these bolt holes are with the help of uh, what you call the... Um, <coughs> uh, there's a word for it. By frame structure on the guide, they are bolted against the A-frame and the... Uh, the casing, crankcase casing. So the ultimately the A-frame and the crankcase casing absorb the transfer thrust. But within the crosshead, the, it requires lubrication because not only really is it thrusting, it is also rubbing against the surface. So the oil which passes through is allowed to be distributed by means of gutters. Gutters are actually shallow grooves. And these grooves allow for the oil to pass through the entire surface. And while it rubs, it comes out from the gutters and it spreads on the contact surfaces. All right. 
Now, as the oil travels through the gutters, at the top gutter that you see, that has got two holes at the ends. All right. So the oil enters through that and comes out to the other side. And this also it comes out to the other side. Now, on the other side of this plate, what you see is up here over top. And this has got two uh, long uh, lengthwise strips of white metal, which also have grooves. All right. So the oil which emerges from here and here ultimately spreads to the entire surface. Why? Because it is rubbing against the internal surface of the guide over here along this length along the entire length of the guide on the compression stroke. So each time the engine has an expansion stroke, the forces, the transverse thrust is through the crosshead, through the shoe, onto the guide and onto the A-frame structure. Now when the piston is compressing the air, the angularity of the connecting rod will have changed to the other side. So the transverse force will also change direction. One time it is towards the right side, one time it will be towards the left side. And when it is towards the left side, obviously the contact between this surface and this surface will not be there. And on the contrary, the contact surface of this strip and this strip will be against this part of the guide because it is in the opposite direction. And remember, the transverse force during the compression stroke is definitely much less than the transfer source when it is on the expansion stroke onto the larger surface area. Sir Chaki? Yes, sir. So, uh, sir, in four stroke we use gudgeon pin and in two stroke we use uh, piston pin, sir. Uh, is that how it works? It will be the same thing. One time the skirt will take the force on this side, one time the skirt will take the force on the other side. That's all. There is no difference. Sir, so, but so the the one during the expansion stroke, the force will be much more. Remember. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, is is garden pin and uh, piston pin the the same thing? Sorry, correct. Come again. Sir, is garden pin and uh, piston pin are the same thing? Yes, you can say it. No, no, piston pin or crosshead pin. This is the crosshead pin, and don't call it piston pin. Call it garden pin. There are no doubts about it. Yes, sir. Okay. Because, you know, in some pistons, they have dowel pins. These are locating pins to locate the bush also. Now, when you say piston pin, some person may get confused with piston pin and dowel pin. So, best is to give it a static or a standard name, gudgeon pin. But this yes, gudgeon sir. pin for smaller engine is called a wrist pin. All right. Because the movement of the piston relative to the connecting rod is similar to your fist and your arm. It can move only in this direction. It's very difficult to move the uh, fist in right angles to the movement it can. So that is why that gudgeon pin in a small piston unit or a small engine is called a wrist pin as if the movement is from the wrist. So that is why it's called a wrist pin. Gudgeon pin is there. Any other name? Um, gudgeon pin, wrist pin, piston pin. Piston pin should carry the idea, but it will also cause some amount of confusion. So avoid writing piston pin, write gudgeon pin. G-U-D-G-E-O-N, gudgeon pin. Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else has any question? Any little doubt also, get it explained. Okay, let's read up through. This is an old uh, image. Uh, yes, what is it? Uh, lubricating from the uh, uh, reverse side, sir. Uh, when you when we are of the shoe, huh. sir, does it leak from the guide when it's uh, moving up and down? Uh, no problem. It is In pouring the into the crankcase. It is Niagara Falls waterfall. So oil will be falling. It will be pouring in. I don't think you have seen that engine in our workshop. Have you with the crankcase door open? Uh, the big one, sir, or the yeah, uh, yeah, the big one, big one, the one right at the back of our workshop in college. No, sir, we haven't. Oh, oh, okay. Next time we get a chance, I will open the crankcase door for you, and I will start the lube oil pump. All right, 
and then you will see it is Niagara Falls inside the Kankes. It is simply pouring out. And where is it pouring out from? All these clearances that are there. So it is flooded with oil. It is flooded with oil, this whole space. Okay. Because when the force is there, that time the oil is squeezed out between the surfaces. That is why you need these gutters, which will enable the oil to travel right through and into the other surfaces. If this full surface was a completely a flat surface against another flat surface, then the oil holes will become blocked. Similar to your gajin pin lubrication. If the surface is closing that oil hole, there will be no emergence of oil. But if there are gutters between the surfaces, then through those surfaces, the oil will be able to travel and go to the reverse side and ensure that the oil is there in plentiful amount. All right. Sir, okay. sir, sir but uh -huh. in Gaussian pins, hello, sir, but uh -huh. in Gaussian pins, sir, we, uh, uh, there is a non-written wall no, for, uh, to prevent the backflow of oil. Where you have seen in Gaussian pin, there is non-written valve. Uh, no, I have never seen a non-written valve in the Gaussian pin. I am telling you, it is acting like a non-written valve because the Gaussian pin is landing on the surface and the surface has got a hole. So the hole becomes blocked. Unless the uh, pin lifts, only when the pin lifts, then the oil can come out from that hole. But if the gajin pin falls flat on the surface where the hole is, then the oil cannot come out. So that is why it is acting like a non-return valve. It can only come in one direction. Other direction does not go. It is acting like a valve, not even non-return valve. Don't think about non-return valve. If there is a hole through which the oil is coming, and you put your palm against it. Will the oil come out? It will not come out. Only when you remove your hand, then only the oil will come out. The same thing is happening with the gajin pin and the connecting rod with the bronze bush. The oil can come out only when the gajin pin is lifted up. And this gajin pin is lifted up during the induction stroke when the connecting rod is pulled downward by the crankshaft. The induction stroke where is, is it getting the energy to pull the piston down from? It has to be from the crankshaft. Where does the crankshaft get that energy? From the flywheel. Flywheel is a potential energy retaining item. Have you understood? Hello? Y yes, sir, yes. Okay. Let's move on. Yes, sir, read, yes. Let's read through this. The o o M A N. This is an old. This is intended mainly to give you a very clear concept of how that cross-head bearing works and the guide and guide shoe consists of a forged steel block shoe and the guide. The shoe is bolted to the block with six bolts. So one, two, three, four, five, six. The white metal lined flange sides of the guide and maintains alignment of the block. You see this white metal line. It remains inside the guide. The guide is fixed to the A-frame very rigidly and this slides inside and for a very large engine the clearance between this shoe and this guide is 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 millimeters so you can imagine how thin it is as thin as a sheet of your paper so the clearance is so fine 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 millimeters is the clearance allowed between this surface and the guide. It is not rattling inside. Don't assume it is rattling inside. It is very smooth and a very sliding surface. Just enough to allow it to slide. There is no worry about lube oil because there are gutters to allow for the oil to travel to the parts where it is going to make contact. Okay. The white metal line flange slides in the guide and maintains alignment of the block. That alignment factor is very important. The guide is bolted to the engine casing, stiffened or absorbing the lateral thrust. Okay, that, that guide has to be very, very strongly supported. When we go to that workshop engine, we will show you the side where the thrust is taken is made extra strong. It has got a ribbed structure where the casing is. It is not just a thin plate. It is a ribbed structure, thick ribs to make it very, very rigid and robust. Okay, lateral thrust. 
the piston pump is fitted atop the block over the stud as shown. Okay, I have not shown the piston palm, but you have to imagine the piston palm resting on the top surface with four of these studs passing through the holes of the piston palm. Okay. The bearing pins allow for the connecting rod attachment and swivel action. So this one and this one allows for the bearings to be fitted. And those bearings are fitted on the tabletop arrangement of the connecting rod and allows the connecting rod to move. I think we saw that diagram in that uh, video um, connecting rod. Shall I check it out? Um, okay, I will. I will check it out one on the next class. We will see. This class is almost ending. I have not done much of plates also. I wanted to finish this today. No, I don't think we can finish. Better be thorough than to be fast. Okay, so you have a diagram here, and the next is yeah. Let's go on to the piston assembly of a two-stroke engine. Okay. In the piston assembly, in the two-stroke engine, the piston assembly consists of the crown, the skirt, the rings, and the piston rod. All right. In a long-stroke engine, you may not have the skirt. So you'll have only the crown. And it'll be a little longer crown. It will not be the usual crown where a skirt is fitted. The crown will be marginally longer. <clears throat> okay, so in a long stroke engine, you will not have the skirt. Sir, in can a... you show the skirt part? Sorry, come again. Sir, can you please show the skirt part? The skirt part? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll come to it. We'll come to it. Uh, uh, where's the diagram here? Yeah. yeah, see, this part is called the skirt. And this is the two piece uh, piston, or rather, three piece. Because the skirt is one part, the crown is one part, and the piston rod is rigidly fixed to the crown and holding the skirt at the simultaneously. The skirt has got a flange over here. So the bolt, which has got elastic bolts, is fitted inside here and bolted on. So this part is called the skirt, and this part is called the crown. The crown is bore cooled. Okay, so first let's read up on what we have. We'll come to this diagram again. But remember, these are the parts which consist of the piston assembly in a two-stroke engine. This red color is not being seen very clearly. Let's make it bright yellow. And bold. Yeah, now it looks so much better. Isn't it? Same to the four-stroke. I'm improving in my ability to draw PowerPoint. I never could do it well before. Okay. Now let us see it. Yeah, now it stands out. So in the two-stroke engine, the piston assembly consists of these. Material used, the crown is mostly cast steel. This cast steel will also have vanadium, molybdenum, and all these rare metals to make it very, very strong and resistant to corrosion, resistant to burning. But it's a very high-grade cast steel. Never mind what the constituents are there. Your information as cast steel is adequate. The skirt is made of cast iron. Because it does not have to take that much of load or that much of stress. The cast iron skirt is largely to align the piston and arrange for keeping the inlet and exhaust ports covered during the uppermost position of the piston. So the piston which you saw just now, it was a piston of an engine which had inlet port and exhaust ports. Okay, so other than the cast iron skirt and the cast steel crown, it has piston rings which are made of cast iron. Okay, the piston rings are made of high grade cast iron, and they are, I think, spheroidal cast iron, which are also centrifugally cast. Close-grained cast iron. They are very good cast iron. I have seen broken pieces of piston ring being used to hammer something also. They are capable of taking that much of stress. They are not like ordinary cast iron where you have casings and valves made of. They are very good quality cast iron. Then you have the piston rod. The piston rod is a forged steel rod and the surface finish is hardened. 
it is not only hardened it is also polished and it is got a mirror like surface because it has to slide inside the stuffing box and that stuffing box has got sealing rings these sealing rings are again made of bronze all right this bronze when it rubs against steel which one is going to wear out first obviously the bronze the bro and what is bronze made of i think um who can tell me shubhankar tell me what is bronze made of aski what sir what is bronze made of bronze i don't know what is brass brass and copper sir brass copper sir yes, copper. brass and copper alloy of brass and no sir yeah. alloy of copper and tin copper and tin sir alloy of copper and tin bronze and nickel also sir it is made of copper and tin copper and tin and brass is made of copper and zinc remember brass is weaker than bronze and on board the ship we very rarely use brass most of it is bronze very small non very important items are made of brass but most of the items are made of bronze bronze is much more resistant to corrosion it is much stronger than brass brass is something very weak and it is also corrodible because the zinc in the brass is on the higher side of the electrochemical series and that is very easily corroded so what you have is selective corrosion of brass which leaves behind a spongy mass of the brass which is actually a copper copper is left over and zinc is corroded because these are not compounds brass is a mixture bronze is a mixture all these are mixtures alloys are all mixtures they are not compounds i hope you remember your school chemistry what is a compound what is an element what is a mixture air is a mixture you can take out the oxygen from it but from a compound you cannot take out so easily sodium hydroxide so the hydrogen oxygen and sodium you cannot take them out so easily so that is why they are a compound so that is why brass is not very commonly used on the ship it is used on shore very commonly because they are not under much of stress but on ship we mainly use bronze and the bronze is a huge family there are so many bronzes that are there of different category different strengths different purposes different levels of corrosion that is why material science as a subject is very important for a marine engineer the material that you use on the ship you must be very very acquainted with what properties it has same way stainless steel what is stainless steel what is the difference between stainless steel and mild steel put down as a paper i am giving you a question right now what is stainless steel and what makes stainless steel stainless all right mild steel is not stainless steel but stainless steel is stainless what makes stainless steel stainless that is the question you write down as a general knowledge question in material science okay let's read on let's finish this plate we are almost we are late let's finish this plate and call it a day in the four stroke engine that is trunk type the assembly consists of the piston this may be in one or two pieces it also has piston rings then it has a bronze bush not a brass bush remember no never a brass bush it is a bronze bush then you have the gudgeon pin the gudgeon pin is held in place by circlips this gudgeon pin is also made of forged steel and it is similar to the piston rod of the two stroke engine it is a high quality steel and it is forged from wrought iron and this gudgeon pin is held in place by circlips the material used for the piston in trunk type of engines is generally aluminum alloy the name is used to be low x low x is a eutectic composition of aluminum and various other elements so it is not just aluminum it is an aluminum alloy and sometimes it is duralumin if you have heard of what is duralumin aeroplanes are made of duralumin 
They are very strong, but they are aluminium, very light. Piston rings are cast iron. The bush is bronze. The gudgeon pin is forged steel, and circuits are made of spring steel. Okay, that be all for today. And up to what I have made as a lecture, I will share with you. And uh, once I get the link, I'll share it with the entire class once it comes on my screen. Okay, so till then. i am saying bye bye uh, let me get a cup of hot water or a cup of tea and that will be all for today if you have any question we'll ask in the next class because your next class is going to start shortly and i'm relieving you from now okay that will be all take care of your health first and everything else later okay bye bye yes sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you sir okay